Well, we are very near the end. Um, this is the second to last lecture, final week of the course. Uh, we are still on the ethics of artificial intelligence, and now we're going to talk about algorithms. Um, they're in the news, right? You may have uh, heard this. I read this maybe a few weeks ago. Um, people that are shopping for Amazon uh, are now sort of the hiring process is completely done by an algorithm and the firing process is completely done by an algorithm. So people are finding that they're being fired for offenses that, you know, they don't think are necessarily wrong, right? They show up someplace and they can't get in, so they're un unable to deliver the package, but the algorithm doesn't care. The algorithm sort of just fires people. There's an appeals process, but it's sort of like difficult to navigate. So it's, this already exists, right? Your algorithms have a fair amount of control of increasing parts of our lives. And so there's definitely um, ethical consideration. So this is a article by John Denner. I think that's how you pronounce his name, I don't know. But, uh, it's called The Threat of Algocracy. He has some interesting arguments about, uh, about this issue. All right. so the issue, the argument he wants to make has to do with the possibility of legitimacy for decisions, rules, uh, et cetera, made by algorithms, right? He thinks there's a an essential conflict between laws and the other sorts of sort of constraints that we accept on our behavior. Um, those are only justified if they're legitimate. And he thinks that there's, it takes some arguing, but he thinks that there's not really any way that algorithms could um, have that sort of legitimacy. So a little background. So algorithms, right, they're making more and more decisions for us. I just described, you know, they'll hire and fire you. Um, they decide what stock trades to make for a lot of, you know, stock trading firms now rely more and more on algorithms. Um, who should be audited by the IRS, right? They sort of search data and find anomalies of, of uh, things for the IRS to look for, look into. Um, Many of you probably are using algorithms, right, to decide your date if you're on Tinder or uh, OkCupid okay or one of those dating apps. Um, this trend is likely to increase, right? So to what degree should algorithms be allowed to make decisions sort of in the public and political sphere? Now, the, the reason we we're asking this question in particular is because public decisions like that um, often result in coercive rules and judgments, right? laws that constrain your behavior, um, arrests, imprisonment, things like that. Um, do we want algorithms making those sorts of decisions? Uh, processes that result in coercive acts like this, laws, arrests, and such and such, generally we say, well, these require legitimacy in some way, right? At least in a democratic country, we say, well, the public needs to support it in some way, either by electing people that enact these laws or by voting directly for the laws and the policies and things like that. They have to be legitimate, right? At least in a society like ours. So the question is, if a public de decision with coercive implications is made by an algorithm, does that undermine its legitimacy? And Donahue says, yes, it does. Um, he's gonna argue that the opacity of algorithms and by opacity, I believe I mentioned that in a previous lecture, but the idea is, um, these are so complex and so sort of radically different from the way our human minds work, particularly these deep learning, machine learning algorithms, um, that they're basically incomprehensible to humans. They're not using the sorts of concepts, the sorts of constructs that we use. Um, and because they're going to be incomprehensible in that way, there's no way that they can be legitimate, right? There's no way that the algorithm could explain to me why the law is a good one and why I should support it, right, with reasons that I would understand. That's just not how it's operating. It's not operating with the same kinds of reasons. Uh, so this represents the threat of algocracy, where the use of algorithms constrains the opportunities for human participation in and comprehension of public decision-making, right? All of a sudden, algorithms are, in some sense, in control, um, and we just, there's no way for us to participate. So a little more about algocracy. So it's not like Terminator, where, right, where the uh, Skynet sort of takes over, right, the computers take over the country and start running it without our consent. 
it's not even necessarily a negative thing, algocracy, right? So uh, Donner d describes it, defines it as a system in which algorithms are used to collect, collate, and organize the data upon which decisions are typically made and to assist in how that data is processed and communicated through the re relevant governance system. Um, that can be fine. That can help us, right, in making these decisions. Uh, but in so doing, they do place constraints on human activity um, in the same way that these governmental public processes would if human agents were doing it, right? So they, they in so, a sense, take some of our workload off our backs, and we want that. But in so doing, they're doing some of the work humans would do. And when that's in the realm of coercive public policy, we may have to worry. Um, they may be automated to greater or lesser degrees. You know, there, we can certainly, there's various levels of human oversight that you can employ. So that's the general definition, but let's get into some more sort of concrete applications. So data mining, for example, right? So data mining it defines as the non-trivial process of identifying valid, novel, potentially useful, and ultimately understandable patterns in data, right? So more and more, we are able to collect more and more data, right, automatically from people's cell phone records and the uh, right, financial records. There's a lot of data out there, so much so that it can often be difficult for humans to sort of pour through all that data and find patterns. So we have algorithms that can do that for us. Um, they can sort of, data mining can be used descriptively to try to understand the world, understand patterns in the data, or predictively, right? It can, we can try to anticipate people's behavior by looking at various kinds of data and even potentially control that behavior, right? So one example, um, an algorithm might go through financial data in order to try to find tax fraud or right embezzlement or something like that. Maybe even to predict who might commit fraud in the future, right? If it finds correlations between certain kinds of behavior and fraud later on. Um, now in these sorts of data mining algorithms, humans can be in the loop, on the loop, or out of the loop. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie In the Loop. It's it's pretty funny, but it's not really about algorithms. But um, okay, so to be in the loop, right, means that a human's approval is required for some essential part of the process, right? So it has to stop. At some point it stops, a human says, okay, go on. Um, on the loop means it can run on its own, but humans have the option to sort of jump in and intervene at any time, but they don't have to. It can run without a human. And then out of the loop means there's no human involvement whatsoever. So for example, an algorithm could comb through data, right, looking for tax cheats and if humans are in the loop, it would just forward that right data to a human for further analysis, and that human will then make recommendations. It needs to be audited. Um, or the algorithm could automatically produce those recommendations itself, um, file court summons, right, mail out the audit letter, um, you know, with maybe a, a human on the loop that could override it, or maybe even without, maybe humans out of the loop entirely. So another uh, right thing about data mining systems, they some they can be interpretable or non-interpretable. So what this means, um, an interpretable system means that the system can be understood by a human. If it's non-interpretable, it means that it's not the system right that's being employed is just not reducible to sort of a human language explanation. It's not using the sort of concepts or the sort of language or rules that that we can understand. Um, so the worry here is um, there's a couple different concerns people have about data mining. Um, one that you may be familiar with is the hiddenness concern. So maybe you don't know that your apps are tracking your location, right? Or that they're um, tracking your purchasing behavior or whatever. So this happens all the time, right? People are pretty aware of it and concerned about it. And, and often at least, you know, some people are very careful to make sure that no one gets their data. But that's the concern of hiddenness, right? That they're People are somehow grabbing your data in a secret manner without your consent. Now, the opacity concern, which is much more relevant to this article, is a different sort of concern. And this is a concern about the intellectual and rational basis for these systems. So the, the worry is that the way these systems work is just not accessible, right? It's opaque to human reason and understanding. So. Well, back, so I think I've described how they could be opaque, right? Again, 
I don't know if you know anything about neural nets and stuff like that, but like in a sense, they develop their own concepts and they categorize right uh, inputs and process data and, and make outputs. But when they have sort of these hidden networks, right, these hidden layers in the network, um, they sort of invent their own sort of categories categories for things. And, and, and we sort of give them examples and we train them, right, if they skip the back the wrong output. Uh, you know, you can have it, you can, you can give them an error signal and they'll, and they'll change the connections until they start getting the answers right. But the way the machine figured out how to get the right answers, uh, it uses categories that are not the types of categories that humans use. Um, okay, so that's the sort of opacity. You can have a computer that can really be really good at detecting fraud or de recognizing faces or cats or whatever, but um, it does it in a way that is kind of very different than the way we do it, or at least the way we would explain it, right? It may be actually very similar to the way our brains do it. Um, but as far as the way we have access to the reasons we use to make decisions, it, it doesn't do, the, do things that way. Okay, so opacity and legitimacy. So uh, the issue with legitimacy is a concern about privacy and consent. Um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So, <clears throat> Back to data mining, um, right? And the uh, the hiddenness concern. Okay, that's a concern about privacy and consent. But the concern about opacity is different, right? It concerns our very ability to participate in democratic procedures, right? So this is where the problem with legitimacy comes in. So legitimacy is a property that coercive public decision-making processes must have if they're going to sort of rightly and justly exercise authority over our lives. This is sort of the fundamental idea of a democratic society, right? If you're going to um, put right restrictions on what I can do, um, I need to have some say in that, right? The legitimacy can be gained by the, cons there's sort of two ways they posit that you could get legitimacy. So one is instrumentalist, and that just means if it has good consequences, it's legitimate, right? So if it reduces crime, um, then good. It must be a good policy, right? It's legitimate. Um, Another way is proceduralism. So we say a, a good policy is a one that is enacted in the right way, right, by the consent of the governed or something like that, or Congress, right, or whatever. Um, so you could see how a purely instrumentalist view of legitimacy um, might favor algocracy. Uh, so consider this, this argument. So here's an argument for algocracy that he considers and eventually he's going to um, argue against. Right? So Premise one, there are procedure independent outcomes against which the legitimacy of public decision making procedures ought to be judged. This is the cognitivist thesis. And what this, the, what this premise is saying is, youth, right? So what it's saying that it's not just sort of the consent of the governed. That's not the only um, criteria by which we should judge our um, decision making procedures. Maybe we should judge them based on outcomes, right? So even if the public doesn't like it, right, if we have a policy that gets crime down to zero or like eliminates murders or something like that, then we should pursue it, right? That's the idea. Um, this, that's the sort of instrumentalist thesis. Okay, well, um, number two, in any given society, is that really the cognitivist thesis? That could be a misprint because that just sounds like instrumentalism. Um, I don't have time to check it right now. So maybe double check the, the labels I put in these. You're not gonna be tested on like the labels of each premise, right? So don't worry too much about the name of the, the thesis and just try to follow the argument. So the first one is basically, premise one is instrumentalism, right? And it says, yeah, the, the procedure, right? Where we ask people and make sure we get their consent, that's not the only concern. Maybe we should worry about outcomes, like a consequence. Premise two, in any given society, there's going to be a group of people with superior epistemic access to those procedure independent outcomes. So I guess you could think of like super util utilitarian brains that are able to sort of like calculate right, all the, um, the potential pleasures and pains right, that will be produced by any given action or any given policy. And they're going to be able to see which policies are going to create the most utility for the greatest number of people. And they're going to be able to tell us what, what the laws are. So that's I suppose plausible. At least some people are going to be better at the that than others, and maybe there's going to be a small group of people that are amazing at it. Right? 
Okay, three, if there are people with superior epistemic access to these procedure independent outcomes, then procedures are more likely to be legitimate if those people are given sole or predominant decision-making authority. So this sort of follows from one and two, right? If you believe in sort of instrumentalism as an account of legitimacy, say we want the policies that give us the best outcomes, and then you believe premise two, which says some people have better access to figuring out what would create the best outcomes, then it follows that those people should have authority, right? And then so four, and this follows from one, two, and three, therefore in any given society, decision-making procedures are more likely to be legitimate if authority is concentrated in an epistemic elite. Okay. Now, you may not buy all those theses, right? In particular, you might not buy instrumentalism. You might really want to hold on to proceduralism. I think a lot of people would. But anyways, this is one argument that someone might construct for algocracy, um, and sort of a consequentialist argument. They say, look, if you want the best society, you need the smartest people figuring out the procedure to get there. Okay, so that gives us the conclusion that, right, public policy should be determined by whoever has the best ability to predict outcomes. Well, if the best ability to predict outcomes is possessed by an algorithm, then we've got an argument for algocracy, right? Um, however smart the smartest person can do the utilitarian calculus, right, imagine a, a computer, right, a room full of computers all cranking away at the utilitarian calculus, they're going to probably going to be better than any human. So you might worry, right? So now maybe you don't buy instrumentalism, though, right? Maybe you say, okay, nonetheless, that's going to be illegitimate because we need more than just good outcomes, right? We need, again, some kind of procedural thing that gives people input in the problem. So the governed need the rules of the system to be comprehensible to them so that they can rationally decide to accept or reject them, right? So you might imagine, okay, yeah, let the computers crank away, make suggestions, right? But then run it by the people, and they're gonna right. Um, they're gonna sort of like review the the computer's reasons for for saying that this is the best outcome, and they'll decide whether to go for it or not. Right? Now here's the problem. That step often can't happen. The the computer's reasons are not going to be human style reasons, right? So they'll give you the outcome, right? And they'll probably statistically be correct, but they're not gonna be able to convince you of it. Right? They're not gonna give you reasons why you should choose that one or why it'll give you the best outcome. Um, so this opacity concern is gonna be sort of a block to legitimacy. So here's a sort of a concrete example to hopefully try to make sense of this opacity. Um, so the Amazon warehouse, right? Very efficient system, right? But before COVID at least, I remember being shocked by, right? You would order something, it would be there like same day at your house, it was astounding. and then. COVID hit and everyone was ordering from Amazon and it slowed down a bit. But um, this is in part due to their um, sort of novel storage algorithm. So I don't know if you've ever worked in a warehouse. I worked in one at a record label for a while, or stacking boxes CDs and stuff. Um, you kind of have to organize them according to some system, right? Categories that make sense to you. Maybe you worked in a library or something. So it'll be, it'll be alphabetical, do a decimal. Uh, maybe you have, you know, if you work at Home Depot, you got the plumbing in one section, right? The, lumber and another, um, but it's going to create some inefficiencies, right? Because um, the size and the shape of the items are not necessarily going to match up with those categories, right? So you're going to have basically a bunch of wasted space, right? So if you're trying to keep all the plumbing in one area, um, maybe there's going to be some smaller pieces that are to fit. You're just going to have sort of empty spots, right? Because the boxes just aren't going to perfectly Tetris together because that's not what you're prioritizing. You're prioritizing something else for customers to be able to find it or whatever. Um, but Amazon, Amazon totally prioritizes efficiency. And to do that, they use a categoriz categorization system that's basically incomprehensible to humans. So there might be wrenches next to cat food, right next to um, iPhones or whatever. Um, and it's, but the boxes are gonna be like perfectly, perfectly, uh, space space is going to be maximized right and even maybe the efficiency of picking the stuff up is going to actually be maximized but in a way that's not necessarily comprehensible to humans um so workers have to use the algorithm to be able to find what they need right they they can't say oh i'll just yeah you know, it's over in the the bees right it's not going to be alphabetical um so they have no understanding of why the items are where the computer says they are they just follow the algorithm now 
technically there is a way and the, the system could be described as making sense of both of these rules, right? If, if, they're, if it's based on maximizing space, I can understand that concept of maximizing space. Um, but my, what my mind can't do is make the calculations that are necessary to actually do that sort of organ. So there's a level of opacity there, right? So you can kind of get a, a grip on, on what we're talking about. Okay, so given all these considerations, now uh, Donner constructs an argument against algocracy. So it goes something like this. Uh, premise five, legitimate decision-making procedures must allow for human participation in and comprehension of those decision-making procedures. Uh, six, so this, right, so premise five is an assumption that instrumentalism is not true, or at least not completely true, right? There has to be something in addition to the perfect, to the great outcomes, right? There has to be some human participation we have to be able to understand. Increasing reliance on algocratic alg systems limits the scope for active human participation in and comprehension of decision-making procedures. So that's what we just argued, the opacity thesis. Therefore, reliance on algocratic systems is a threat to legitimate decision-making. To be clear enough, right? Think. The humans need it in some way to be able to participate or understand the reasons for the rules that are being made by an algorithm, then there's reason to think that can never happen and, and therefore they can never be legitimate. All right, so now we consider a couple of objections. Um, first, well, even if we can't understand the details, right, of the algorithm, um, if we understand the big picture, right, you know, again, like, well, I get that they're trying to save space or maximize space, Amazon, um, or that the algorithm is trying to identify tax sheets. You know, wouldn't that just be enough? The response is no, we, we need more. He doesn't really explain why in that section, but I think it kind of is, I guess, discussed earlier. But I intuitively can see why that really wouldn't um, be satisfactory, right? If, uh, if you're the one, right, that gets picked out for an audit, and you want to know, well, wait, why was I picked? And they just say, well, you know, it's designed to, to pick out tax sheets and you're identified as a tax sheet. You want to know right, more details. You want to know much more about why you were picked. And that's what you can't get from the algorithm. Okay, um, then maybe we just make different algorithms that people can understand. And yeah, in principle, yes, right? They might not be as good, they might not be as efficient, but you know, um, at least they would be understandable and that seems to be an important virtue. Um, but there are obstacles to this, right? So first of all, there's intellectual property considerations, um, anti-hacking considerations that you might wanna keep these secret, right? First of all, if you designed the algorithm and you'd like to get paid for it, you probably don't want everyone to be able to make one themselves. And also, yeah, you don't want somebody to be able to get in there and hack them. So there's considerations that push in favor of secrecy, and that's gonna be in tension with this um, claim that people need to understand them. Um, second of all, it's just, what makes these so good is there is the machine learning sort of paradigm and that whole thing as i described these neural nets they're just essentially incomprehensible to humans right and it's funny in that they kind of are modeled on human brains in a way and they kind of work the way human brains but i don't actually have access to like the way my brain is doing stuff either right and so again that it's hard in principle if if the algorithms are of this type, it's hard to see how we can make them so that human, uh, humans could understand their reasons for. And then finally, the algorithms tend to be built on top of each other. The end result is just so complex that, right, one of these algorithms is worth its salt. Doing this stuff that's really hard for humans to do, it's going to be hard for humans to follow it. That's why we use them, right, because it's hard for humans to follow. But you can't deny there's benefits, right? So the, um, the entire reason for their existence is they do things better than we can do them on our own. Um, we want to find tax sheets. We want to have more efficient energy grids. We want stuff in the mail quickly and cheaply. Um, it might also be possible that algorithms are, I mean, we have our own biases and our own problems, right? And algorithms might be better than us, right? So, um, you know, if we have sort of like racial biases or gender biases in our brains, maybe algorithms won't have those, right? And maybe that's a good thing. Um, of course, you never know. They might just replicate their own biases or generate even new weirder biases. Uh, so it's hard to say. Um, but it seems to be, you know, here to stay and it seems to be useful. So the question is, could we 
Could we live without Gocracy? Is, is there a way to make it work? So, I mean, there is some sort of legal, at least in the EU, right? They do have human review of any algorithm that, that might affect people's lives in some way. Um, and again, of course, there's this whole opacity concern. So human review only makes sense if they're not totally opaque to humans, and it seems like a lot of the good ones are. Um, and if even if, if there are some humans that understand, it's not going to be everybody. And uh, if they're only interpretable to a few humans, that all of a sudden concentrates a lot of power in these few people, right? Now we do that all the time, right? The president has a lot of power too. We do concentrate power in a few people, um, but it's always something to be wary of when we create a sort of spectrum of people that have a lot of authority. Um, one option is just you know try to make humans smarter so we could keep up with these algorithms and interpret them. The problem with that is like as we've been saying, it's just kind of a radically different sort of intelligence, right? It's not reasons based like human um, intelligence is. So it's not clear that just making humans smarter is going to make them think like these machines. So we've, maybe we've got these few elites that kind of have some access to understanding, right, the algorithms, and maybe we could use technology to surveil the elites who run and benefit from the algorithms, right? So keeping some kind of check on on those people that have sort of an immense amount of power. The problem is that's just more data collection, right? So again. Um, you have to have algorithms to run that data, right? And so that's going to be unintelligible to humans. Um, so you might think, okay, well, we can have we can have our algorithms that will process data, right, on the the elites we're trying to monitor. Um, maybe each person has their own algorithm that can somehow sort of like keep you up in the arms race against the other algorithms, right? So each person has their own AI assistant that helps them monitor the elites. Right, uh, analyze the algorithms, making sure they're not being treated unfairly. Um, this is kind of conceivable, right? So the best chess players in the world right now are, are neither humans or computers, but kind of these human computer teams. So maybe you need to, each person needs to team up with an AI, and now you got the best of both worlds. You got these algorithms giving us great outcomes in society, and you got humans paired with algorithms that are sort of monitoring the algorithms and making sure that we, in some sense, understand why right their their reasons or what they're doing and keeping an eye on them um but again if you're just using these algorithms but not understanding them are you really in control right um sort of has some moral implications for autonomy we've just discussed autonomy a great deal in the, in the last week so i mean maybe we just sort of become more fully integrated into the ai right now it's if it's part of you then it's not there's less of an autonomy worry, right? Because it's you, it's just the AI part of you. You know, are we part of a Borg now if you're aware of Star Trek and, and that sort of thing? So, you know, maybe the problem simply dissolves if we all become sort of human algorithm hybrids. Um, maybe that sounds great to you. Maybe that sounds terrifying to you. It's it's one, uh, so I think in general, right, he's arguing against how, these algorithms and saying that's it's hard. He doesn't really see a way that they can be uh, legitimate, right? Um, here he offers one. If here's maybe one way they could be legitimate, but it's pretty sci-fi and and uh, scary to you, or maybe not. Maybe not the future. Right in a hundred years, this will seem totally normal. Okay, so uh, one more lecture to go, right? And that'll be about predictive policing. A couple um, real-world examples of sort of algorithms that have been used by police um, and what's ethically probably problematic about that. So uh, we'll see you then.